done this before <laughs> let's go again <laughs> guys i'm so happy to talk <laughs> <laughs> it's so fun you can say what's happening right? it's part of the process yeah guys so after like one hour and a half <laughs> we almost finished the podcast and we realized that we didn't press record which is so, kind of normal right that's normal and thanks for our special guest here today he's patient and he's still here. We are gonna be doing this again with you guys, Tim Whitlow. <laughs> Tim, thank you so much for coming here. Thanks for having me. That's the. It looks like this is the second time I'm saying this to you, right? <laughs> <laughs> but man, thank you so much for accepting our invitation. I'm really glad that you are here, and I hope we can maybe talk about everything again that was really amazing let's yeah. see if we can remember everything I'll try it, yeah. <laughs> but Tim, tell me about it um how come did you start to work with photography and videography it all started back when i was 12 and my mates and i would ride at the skate park on our bmx bikes and we'd film little like web edit videos really fun um, uh -huh. And from there, I sort of didn't do it a lot. I kind of, when I was younger, I wanted to also like design websites and stuff. I'm so glad I don't do that now because <laughs> sitting at a desk for me is extremely boring. I like to <clears throat> be out shooting and not so much sitting down too much. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, and then from there, we would go camping, like mates and I had four drives, so we'd go camping and we'd have GoPro and we'd film random things like a bit of four driving action and mm -hmm. like, we'd bring blow up pools and we'd go down to a dam in Collie and we'd chuck these no blow up pools and we'd use them like big sofas and we could all <laughs> hang out in these pools, it was so much fun. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah, I have a photo, I'll find that for you as well. It's oh fun. yeah, please send <clears throat> Yeah. That would be amazing to see, man. That's funny, hey. Man, it's so good. We did it like I was in the 10th grade at school and we bought a blow up pool and we took it to the beach and there's like 10 of us in this thing and we're surfing on like these little waves and just like trying to ride these waves into shore. Man, that's so fun. Uh, yeah. But you're filming these as well? Nah, there's a photo of it. If uh, I can find it, I'll, I'll have to show <laughs> you that as well. It's hilarious. But um, yeah, so from the... Um, yeah, 16, going camping and stuff. And then from there, <clears throat> my friends had cool street cars, so we would shoot those. Uh -huh. And yeah, it started from there. And when you say that you start to shoot with the, do you have like a camera, a gimbal? Yes, yeah, so I bought my first camera in 2017. It was a Sony A6000 and it had a little kit lens. Uh -huh. And I shot my very first car video. It was shot on like a tripod I got from JB Hi-Fi. It was so crap. It's just like doing these pan shots and a bit of handheld stuff. And it actually, it was all right. I'll find that as well because I know I have it. And show you that. And then from there, I sh started to shoot stills for a while. So I was into street, <clears throat> um, a lot of landscape. I l sort of learned to shoot shooting uh -huh. landscape. Um, and then from there... It was just random stuff like a bit of modeling stuff and did just you really fun. Yeah yeah, yeah yeah a little bit um and adventures and things like that uh -huh. <clears throat> kind of lifestyle stuff and then it eventually went back to cars and i started to shoot cars again and i was like oh man this is fun and then i saw people had like gimbals so i got a little gimbal and i'd shoot a bit of gimbal stuff like out the window and <laughs> all that. But, uh, when you talk about cars do you have like a passion for cars as well or? yes yeah so I don't really know when it all started, but I'm sure it was when I was quite young. Um, always sort of into cars. I've had a couple of fun cars over the years. Uh -huh. And then, yeah, it's just progressed from there. And I've kind of had these two passions slowly come together and make it up. Make it up. Yeah. What, what's your dream car? Oh, man. Someone asked me this the other day and... It's a tough question. 
I mean, dream. Maybe like a Koenig Seg Agera. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Uh, that's amazing. Koenig. What about you? Uh, that's a good question. Hey, but I, I really like. Um, of course, we like a Ferrari, um, Bentley. Man, um, the Maserati. There's always like some cars that, especially, I don't know why, but uh, English cars are always the ones that always I don't know caught my attention. I don't know if it was because of the W07, 007 and watching that, and Austin Martin seeing those cars, they always caught a little bit more my attention. Just because everyone talk about Ferrari, talk about the other cars, and sometimes forget those yeah. cars that are amazing. The Aston's are. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's, there's so many, it's incredible, man. And there's so many cars and now, especially with the, everyone trying to change for electric and the new technology and people changing few things. I'm really fascinated to see what's happening, what's changing. And even thinking that the F1 is going to move from fuel to electric. Yeah. That's so kind of scary or it's a bit yeah. <laughs> I'm not a fan of that, but um But what are you gonna be doing, hey? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting um it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Yeah, hundred percent, hey. Yeah. What are your thoughts about it? I'm not a fan of electric. I don't you see like there's a few models of electric cars that have come out that haven't done too well. There was uh -huh. a um Ford, I think it's the F-150 electric and these people bought it to tow their boat to the lake in America and they said they'd driven about 51 miles or something and it ran out of charge. Really? So there's pros and cons uh -huh. to everything. So the electric technology is, I think there's other solutions that might be a bit better mm. in some ways like hydrogen cell and other things like that. but. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Yeah, um, I, I can imagine now that because if you are in the sideway of like a F1 track or racing track mm. and you can see like F1 is... can imagine with electric. Yeah, I think it really... Would, yeah. It'd just be like... I think that would take away from the character of it. It just sounds like... Yeah, what it'll sound like <laughs> yeah it'll be it'll yeah. be interesting to know hey mm. cool and um all these process that you start to be like photography videography and um you move for your special gimbal from jb hi-fi your sony camera and what's happened after so we progressed a bit from there um i built the first ever camera car type setup is this thing, my best mate Denyon, shout out to Denyon as well, because he's, without him building this thing that we had built, there would be no THW visuals, I reckon, really, like it wouldn't be as good as what it is now. Oh. So, without him first building this um, little camera arm, the thing, uh -huh. um, yeah, I don't think there would really be what it is now. And, and how do you have did you chat with him and how come he come back he came with this idea to build this arm yeah so i had like seen photos of i think what it was this flow cine black arm uh -huh. and we built a really really cheap version it was 100 bucks worth of stuff from bunnings really so i had this old hatchback and i had the we take the rear seats out so i could put more stuff in it um but what i've done is i built a frame from wood and it's so shit now that when I think about it, I'm like, man, it was so bad. <laughs> but you have to start somewhere. <laughs> um, so <laughs> That's I, true. Yeah, I cut up these bits of wood and built like a frame that would strap down to the floor of the car uh -huh. and gave a spot for this arm thing to attach. So my mate helped me build the arm. He welded up some pieces and it attached to this frame and then the gimbal can attach to the end of the arm and it would sort of take up some of the bumps from the road. And also I had the Sony lens with the image stabilization thing built in so it can get a bit smoother. <laughs> um, it's, yeah, it's pretty shit. 
Um, and and Tim, I yeah. sorry to, um, uh, I remember that you talking you talking about the crap mm. <laughs> arm or the wood stuff, and I remember like um, you post one time on your social media one video, and you didn't put like the the, the credit or anything, and then when I watch, I say, oh no, Tim, what's happening? Oh, yeah. it, it was yours, <laughs> and after you said that. Oh no, no, that's not mine. Yeah. Um, that feeling to lose like a camera to like a boat could fall off from the arm, that come in your mind very often or what's happening in your arms? Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. There's been one time where I put the gimbal on and put the safety cable from the arm to the gimbal. It has mm -hmm. a special spot for safety chains. Attached it. I jumped in the car and I looked at the monitor and then I thought, I was like, something doesn't seem right. And I jumped back out of the car, went around and there's a latch that, so the gimbal I use attaches to the arm I now use, mm -hmm. slides and there's a little pin and it clicks and it locks in so it can't really come out. Um, but you also have a clamp and you tighten this clamp and then it's properly locked on. So it'd be locked and there's the safety cable and you're sweet. But I almost forgot one time and I was like, oh. So now I have a piece of tape that I stick on the monitor and it says check all safety points. <laughs> so I do that every time I shoot now and no issues ever. But I have seen a few videos of like, um, there's that one of the red on the arm and the arm falls off. Apparently that was a PA that had put it on on that job. No safety chain or anything and it just falls off. And Apparently though, they were saying that camera survived and the gimbal was okay, but the lens had sort of like smashed off. Jesus, but, yeah. Man. You wouldn't want that. There was um, another thing in China that happened where there was an arm and the arm, the crane operator, or arm, whatever you want to call it, they didn't, they weren't paying attention and the arm was out the side, crane out the side, and it hit like a light post. Oh, light post. There was an Arri Alexa on there and it dropped like, 20 meters and broke. Man, I saw that. It's and so I, expensive, man. And, and can you imagine, because <clears throat> underneath of this bridge could be like another road, right? Yeah. Can you imagine if you fall in a car or falling in someone? Yeah, it like hurt people as well. That's the worst thing I think that can happen is if it hurts another person. But obviously, like equipment damage is... That's so crazy. It was like an Alexa with an ingenue lens. So it's an expensive setup. Yeah, and then yeah. Thinking about security, all this process, all these pieces and pieces that you're talking about, um, do you always put these in practice since we started? Yeah, yeah. Ever since I started, I've used some kind of safety chain thing to stop the gimbal ever being able to come away from the car, like say detach uh -huh. and roll down the road and hit other cars and cause an accident and stuff like that. It's probably the worst thing I think that could happen. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, we have a lot of processes and stuff in place to stop these kinds of things happening. And, and I think the thing as well is that um, there's companies that have brought out cheaper like little arm setups and stuff, but they don't really sell a lot of safety mm. stuff around it or for it. So um, there's a tilter one that you can just suction onto the back of a car, but you see people using them, not everyone's like strapping them on for safety and it's like you should be doing that you know yeah. it can cause so much so much grief if it drops off if it happens to and that's a good point for example if you buy like a, a arm from Tilta or whatever would be the mm -hmm. brand of course but you kind of rely that the security systems everything will be on place but in your case because you built from scratch and um how come did you come back? Did you came with these ideas to put the security systems to think that it could damage something? How come did you start with that? Um, <clears throat> I think it started, it was like part safety, but also part just wanting it to be solid and um, how do I say, just really strong. So the suction cups, so the way I rigged the car is there's two things that are mounted onto the chassis of my car, they're bolted on. And then we have like a tow hitch type thing that bolts to that. Uh, we put the vertical tube that your arm will clamp onto there. And then there's two on like these clamps that can swivel. 
and they go down to these things with suction cups and each suction cup can hold 90 kilos so they stick oh, on like the roof or the back window of whatever car we're using mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then we will strap it through the doors and around the safety the um suction cup things mm -hmm. so it's all secure so if the suction cup does pop off there's still a strap there to hold it and it won't like fly off oh cool so it's all quite strong safe and secure and do you still uh, that came into my mind now <laughs> I don't know why, but I can imagine if you are sucking the the, the, the wind screen or the screen of the wind and the it wind pulls off. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've thought that a few times. I'm like, man, like this is it. Oh, I feel scared. Is there something that you need to put inside of the car as well to strap or to strap everything? Yeah, or? so um, there's a strap. It kind of runs through inside the car, so ah, it goes through the gotcha. yeah through the doors and then back around and it goes around each. Maybe a cord. It, yeah, <laughs> it holds everything just in in case anything happens. Uh -huh. But uh, there's been a few times where I've thought like, oh, maybe this will like break the back window. But it's never. A lot of people do it too. It's quite common. Preferably, you can attach to roof racks or uh -huh. suction down onto the roof. But some cases you don't. You can't do that. Like on a big four wheel drive, the roof is generally a bit wavy. Oh yeah. Or like, it's not solid. So we use the back window or grab onto okay. like a roof rail or roof rack type thing. Uh -huh. Yeah. And um, from all these um, projects that you have been working so far, which one do you think is more memorable? The one that you love most? Probably the Lamborghini, the Miura Homage. Uh -huh. Miura 50 um, is a limited edition car. There was only ever 50 built which is pretty cool. No and the one we shot is one of one in the color scheme that you could buy, which is pretty cool. It was green and gold. Oh, wow. Um, the other thing that was cool was Atlas Fuels. We shot a thing for them. And so we had a um, twin tanker, like fuel tanker truck. And we shot that going through the city and down south. And we got one shot where it's the lane splits going into the city on the mm -hmm, road. Mm -hmm. And so we got this cool parallax shot driving side by side and you can see it going across the bridge and there's like trees and stuff as you're going past that looks pretty like that's cool cool Just like big truck and going around oh wow yeah, that was pretty cool I think. and is there any project that you did that was kind of scary that something didn't happen the way that you planned yeah the first time we used the flow cine black arm first time i rented it <clears throat> i went to cine machine because i Realized I'd had one and I was like, oh man, like a proper built rig, not like one that we had built in the shed or I've had like mates engineer it and we've kind of built knockoff versions. So it's a real thing and we brought it out. We went to Lancelin in the sand dunes mm -hmm. and my mate has a buggy that he now races and his friend also had a big one. So we put the flow Sydney, the black arm on the back of that. We rigged it all up. And drove it through the sand dunes and we we're going and there's sometimes when you're dunes you have like the small razorbacks and little drops and stuff mm -hmm. and we went off a little drop that just didn't get seen it was we we're going a bit too quick i think dropped off this little drop and the arm just went all the way down mm -hmm. and the gimbal just touched the sand and it sort of tilted like that very quickly and i was like oh what was that we stopped and there's a tiny bit of sand on the bottom of the gimbal so like, oh shit, that was so close but then we went really fast over another bump later that day and the arm moved too much and it has like a hydraulic little pistons in it uh -huh. and we kind of blew one of those up <laughs> oh which is cool it's not uncommon there's a guy um i speak to in france sometimes about the same thing and he's like oh yeah blown up like three of those jesus so, yeah, they're easy to replace, but it's also annoying that you have to do it sometimes. Oh, oh. So I try to be gentle with it, but sometimes you go around the racetrack and we go really fast and you're <laughs> accelerating and braking a lot. Uh -huh. It makes the arm like... Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. And it just wears it out a bit. When you say like you go fast and uh, you have like speed cars, mm. buggies, four-wheel drive, tell me about how you can control the camera, how, it, how that works for you. Yeah, so I've got <clears throat> controller for the gimbal uh -huh. and then I use a Tilter Nucleus M system for focus and camera start-stop for recording. 
all of those two controllers are attached to this lovely board that I've made. Um, it was made out of a piece of chopping board from the kitchen that I found. And I was like, oh, I just chopped this up. Like, I'm not using this anymore. I've got wooden chopping boards. So, yeah. um, I cut up this piece of like this plastic chopping board and drilled two holes in it and you can bolt down the controllers. Uh -huh. I wrapped it in like black tape the night before this shoot. And it looks from, from far away, it looks very professional. But if you look up close, you're like, oh, it's a piece of chopping board <laughs> wrapped in tape. <laughs> But it's sentimental to me. I'm like, oh, this is cool. It's like part of the journey. You know, I did get offered to um, someone's like, oh, you know, like we make a thing for that controller. Like you can buy it off us. It's only $500 US plus shipping. And I was like, what do you mean now? I'm not paying that much and build it for free in the shed. Like I don't give a shit. It's sentimental. It's kind of cool. That's incredible. Um, yeah, but... <laughs> And, and Tim, um, talking about these boards and all these shots uh, we were talking before, um, from where all these ideas of the shooting, all the shots, that from where those ideas came from? What's the source? Um, a lot of inspiration is from commercials and other DPs like in America and Canada and around the world. Uh -huh. <clears throat> I watch some of their stuff. I'm like, oh, that's a cool shot. Like. I want to get a shot like that like you'd be going like kind yeah. of looking and then yeah stuff like that and then youtube videos so there's a people out there who just have like really cool ideas uh -huh. just funny things that you'd never really think of and like, oh that's like that's unique so i'll steal other people's ideas for shots and stuff and then i also have a side project a youtube project uh channel called revved up tv who I shoot with my friend Lathika. Uh -huh. So he's kind of like producer and then I'm kind of like DP or whatever you want to call it. And then we both edit together as well. We sort of share the edit workload and do bits and pieces and it's, that's fun. Um, he brings a lot of ideas for shots to that. He's like, oh, do you think we get like a shot of this? I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah. That's Why not? Like, I yeah. know, I've got an idea. <laughs> we can make that work. So he's a he's a lot of the brains and then uh -huh. I'm a lot of the practical and then we also sort of share you know change, works, change yeah, yeah. Ideas. yeah so it's cool yeah someone thinks and then, oh no yeah I can execute that that's mm -hmm. awesome man. yeah and Tim we, we talk about the that you like YouTube is one of the main source and you mentioned to me that you like to watch films as well right yeah is there any film in your mind that you think would be was your inspiration as well Oh, yeah, there's like, it's good. It's got to be like the old Fast and the Furious films. Like, <laughs> like Those are like classics, yeah. Yeah, I remember like, you watch some of them and you're like, oh man, some of the acting is terrible. <laughs> but there was a lot of like cool shots or like little ideas and stuff, even mm -hmm. like edit, little edit things that they've done. And you're like, oh, like, I never noticed that before. It's like these fast sort of cutaways and like, funny mm -hmm. angle changes that you don't really notice because it looks almost like the camera's panned in one of these shots be like oh that was a that was a hard cut mm -hmm. so yeah there's little films and stuff and like i think there's one called baby driver as well oh yeah that's good yeah yeah so there's yeah a bunch of films like ford versus ferrari there's cool shots in man there. i would be so mad that if you don't tell about this film <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yeah, it was fantastic. Because this film also reminds me the one of the posts that you did recently on your social media, which blew up, right? Yeah, yeah, it was like two, it's like two point four million views or something. Jesus, Ridiculous. man! Yeah. Tell, tell me about it. What was the project? It was, uh, so that was the first revved up TV episode that we shot, and we were shooting camera car stuff. And I had a friend Christian. He was in the back seat, and he, it's a shot he shot on his phone of BTS of me and I'm like just like steering the camera a bit getting this side on shot of this car mm -hmm. and then he like has the monitor you can see you can see like the controller on my lap and then he pans out to the window and the car's right there and it's uh -huh. driving alongside us so it's kind of like you're seeing it on the screen and then he turns and the car's right there in real life and that was a replica of the Ford GT40 it's very famous in racing history. 
Yeah, that's amazing. I, I love that car. Yeah. And also I saw you have like a radio as well that you contact with the other person, the driver from the other car. Yeah. So, so what do you say to them? <clears throat> so, <laughs> um, usually before we would do a shoot, we kind of brief the driver a little bit on how we will shoot things and like you know, instructions and mostly it's a safety thing as well. Like if we're having an issue, we'll pull over to the side of the road and find a safe spot and then rectify whatever the issue is we're having and then we can go off again. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, we use the radios to communicate a lot. And then sometimes on, if there's like a tight road, we'll have a bit of traffic control and we can say like road's clear, we can come and we'll come and like get some nice shots and then pull over at the end. And then, you know, the traffic control will let people through and stuff like that. Yeah. And how many times you have to do the, the shot or be certain that you shoot properly? Sometimes like a couple takes. So far, I think the most takes I needed to get a shot was like four, four or five. Usually it's not too bad depending on how good my focus pulling is on the day uh -huh. because I'm operating the camera and pulling focus. Uh -huh. The focus pulls aren't like, they're not like 85 mil wide open. It's I shoot on a 35 mil lens generally and at like f 2.8 or t 2.8. So it's not too hard to get a little pull from say 10 meters to three meters. So basically what we're saying, you shoot, mm. stop the car, check yep. everything. Mm -hmm. If everything's perfect, let's go home. Yep. Otherwise, let's go again. Yeah. That's not that bad, it's only four times. Nah. It's okay, man. Yeah, so it can be quite generally, we can get a lot of our rolling shots done in three hours. So we've become it's pretty so efficient short. at setting up, having everything sort of ready to go. Uh -huh. With the revved up TV thing, we'll, um, set up a camera car so the monitor's already in the car plugged in ready to go uh -huh. so we'll finish an interview put the interview like lights and stuff back in the car pull all the camera car like the rig and stuff out put it on and then we can go so we can knock out filming for an episode the fastest we did it was six hours i think that's crazy good man. so yeah like an hour set up for an interview and set up your cameras and have a look at everything from their film and hours worth of talking, chatting, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and allow 30 minutes pack down, change, sort of three hour shoot, oh, wow. allow for a bit of pack down again, then yeah. That's incredible. It's and a I'm, lot of work. <laughs> yeah, I can't, man. And I, the other thing I was thinking, um, sometimes you, the way that you're saying you should like really, really good sport cars, right? And um, I do know that sometimes those cars, they don't have too much space, especially in talk about the back seat. Mm. And you mentioned before that you have a lot of equipment that you have to put together and put inside of the car. How, because you said that you need to be quick, mm. how come do you manage to put everything inside of a sport car that generally doesn't have too much space? There's a lot of, Sometimes just using like a wide angle lens can help. Uh -huh. Just things like that. Like if we're shooting inside the car with the driver, we can mount it, um, a few suction cups and stuff and uh -huh. mount it on the windscreen looking at them. But generally the windscreens in those cars are very flat. So you might have to use a polarizer and mount the car on the bonnet. Uh -huh. You can shoot through the windscreen or there's other little things you can do here and there. It's a couple of tricks. Man, that's but good. Yeah. It's, and Always generally, but ge generally you use like cameras or you use like GoPros? Yeah, so everything, all the revved up TV stuff, I'll shoot on my Pocket 4K. Okay. Yeah. The black so, magic. Yeah. How, yeah, and it, do you think like GoPros or the kind of cameras could help you or do you think it's yeah, the quality is not? Like, I like to maintain the image quality throughout if I can. I think there are definitely places for GoPro though, like tight, tight space and stuff like that. GoPro is probably a better option uh -huh. and the new ones are quite good. Like the picture is, you can change the colors around so it looks more like the black magic and you know, you really? can, like the manual camera settings on the new GoPro, mm -hmm. like fix the ISO, fix the shutter, fix the frame rate and everything like that. So it's not like fluctuating like it's not going too dark or too bright you uh -huh. can end it and stuff like that to have more control over your picture uh -huh. i think it's very important 
And even I remember talking with you a long time ago, you mentioned to me that you used to be a Sparky. Yeah. Sparky, right? Or, yeah, Sparky. Or electrician, electrician here. Electrician, right? yeah. Um, do you think this uh, being Sparky or electrician gave you like knowledge for help you to rig up all these equipment, these arms? What do you think was, why do you think, or if it was important for you to be a Sparky before? Yeah, I think it helps. Like there's a lot of times it's come in handy just sort of having a practical background. I can apply a lot of that into what I do now and today. Mm -hmm. um, and also being an electrician, like I can solder if I really have to. Oh. So I can fix cables when they, especially the black magic one, have it a few times it like dies. So you can get a new lead and like put the new cable, the connector on the end. Oh. And then you've got you know, a spare ready to go, or if you can, you know. Oh, you save your life. Uh, yeah, one of my last big client jobs, um, I noticed that my little cable into the camera, the power cable, mm -hmm. had like was dodgy. Mm -hmm. So I had to go find another one. I have like 10 spare now. And I found a little connector. I was like, yeah, cool. Like, put that together and like join the cable and have a spare ready to go. That's so, cool, man. Oh, that was like 11 at night. It was such a nightmare. <laughs> I'm like, oh no, like another thing to stress over. <laughs> <laughs> Listening everything that you're saying, for example, from being spark and mm. working and building up all these arms and shooting everything with small cameras and now shooting with black magics. How come and how did you learn? Because you have to do the editing as well in few times, right? For free projects. Yeah. How was the process for you to learn all these um editing tools what editing tool that you're using now as well i use the best editing tool davinci resolve <laughs> <laughs> the best color grade yeah i suspect you're saying yes yeah, yeah. i mean <laughs> um i did one i did a coloring course uh -huh. which i don't use the same workflow from that anymore i use a much simpler workflow now where i shoot with a monitoring LUT and then I will edit with that light. And then if I want to create a look, I can add a look on top of that. Uh -huh. um, but it gives you like a nice picture to work with, the 709 picture to work with. And it's, yeah. But um, editing, like learning editing and all that stuff was kind of from YouTube and people in the industry just over time, over the last... Uh, actually, no, I did... In school, I did a certificate three in media and we did a little bit of editing. So I learned like the very basics, like how to ingest, cut it together and like deliver. But the last six years I've learned all kinds of other things like how to synchronize your footage with mm -hmm. time code and audio and ha just how to be more efficient, I think is extremely important as well in today's um, today's environment, if you call it that, like, you know, you want to deliver footage faster to your clients. So like, if you know something, you can speed up like time code for interviews is amazing for me. Like you synchronize all the cameras, everything up with the audio recorder. And it's just like chop, 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 chop. And then you cut out the bits you like, and then it's good. You're done. Oh, fantastic, man. Yeah. And I didn't know about that, that you learned this on the school. So when, when you learned at school was basically like Premiere? Yeah, yeah. We learned, I learned in Premiere at school before. I think that's when was Premiere was still pretty good. Uh -huh. I think once they changed to Creative Cloud, Premier it started still. to go to shit. <laughs> <laughs> and then like, I've had to use it. Like, I think I used it last year for a project. I can't uh -huh. remember what the reason was, but whatever it was we used print there for a job and it was okay but it crashes every now and then yeah. Yeah. i think i think that's the only oh not the only but it's one of the drawbacks of the tool the tool yeah. per se is really yeah. good yeah it is a very good but tool. unfortunately crashes all the time and if you're working with projects it's a nightmare you always it's like every 10 seconds safe every time safe yeah. every safe <laughs> and um thinking like the the possibilities and how powerful da vinci can be mm. especially when we talk about color grading yeah you say mm. and it's free like the free version of da vinci uh -huh. is what i have used for ages even when 
I bought my black magic and I had the license key. I didn't use the license key for like three months. No way. And the only thing I use from the paid version of Resolve is the noise plugging, uh -huh. like noise, um, what do you call it? Noise reduction. Noise reduction. Yeah. yeah. I use that a bit, but the free version, you can do anything with Almost really. Everything. Like you just can't export in 4K and you don't have like the noise reduction. The oh. free version does everything though. Like it's amazing. It's cool. You hey. can cut color. You can do all kinds of stuff. Cut it, color, audio, and then deliver. Like. And you don't get stuck on subscription. Yeah, you don't have a subscription. <laughs> yeah, you don't have that fee going out every month. <laughs> because you said that you did a little bit on on this call. Mm -hmm. What? Imagine someone that's trying to start on this field and trying to understand how this process. I'm not saying specifically on the arm, but all mm. this process, because you're talking about photography, videography, you learn how to edit, you learn how to shoot. And the arm, I think, is just the tool for yeah. everything that you do, right? Um, what would be the, the tips that you could do to someone that wants to start on the cinema or photography field? I say, like, you, can, you don't need a camera or a fancy camera to start. You can learn on your phone the biggest things like exposure composition i'd say the next one would be white balance because <laughs> white balance you know it's, it affects the mood of the image and all kinds of things like uh -huh, that uh -huh. and then i'd say the next thing if you want to progress say like shooting videos i'd say learn lighting mm. which is something i'm not the best at that's definitely not the best um after that Oh man, good question. Um, yeah, lighting is an important thing to learn. But if you buy a camera, just learn all the settings. Uh -huh. It doesn't need to be a flash camera. Okay. You cheap Sony, six hundred bucks. You're sorted for a long time, really. Like, it's cool. not about the camera; it's about and, lighting. And, and, and if you have to give like someone um, some feedback or some ideas about who to watch on YouTube, for example, what yes. are the people, what are the channels that you follow? And you say, watch these guys. It would be, it's more cinematography stuff that I watch on YouTube. So uh -huh. Lewis Potts, the local Perth DP is really good. From here, Perth? Yeah. No way. Yeah. I worked with him on a job for Case Machinery. It was really cool to watch him work. Uh -huh. um, and then there's a guy from America, I'm pretty sure. Mark Bone, he does a lot of documentary stuff and he also talks a lot about like workflow and workflow that he uses, which is also really good. So um, between Lewis and Mark, you learn a lot about like lighting from Lewis and uh -huh. techniques like that. And then Mark talks all about a lot of stuff like how to plan a documentary, how to shoot this and that. That's, yeah. That's great. Yeah. And what are the, the main thing or main thing things that you learned with Lewis that you say, oh, uh, that I use now to apply for my workflow for everything that I'm doing now? Just like learning a lot of planning. Okay. Definitely. That's planning, important. Yeah, it's so important. It can, it's easy to overlook it sometimes. Like mm. when I started out and I get little jobs, I like just go there and they're like, oh yeah, you know, there's never really much of a plan. You have a few ideas in your head and you're like, oh, like we want to get a cool shot of this thing and that thing, but to really plan it out, you can be more efficient and better use your time and your client's time. Um, and then other things I've learned, like odd lighting techniques was the first video by Lewis that I watched. And I was like, man, that's so good. Like, like if you're in a small room, that's hard to light, you can just bounce a light off the corner or off the ceiling or whatever, or through the window. Sometimes you shoot it straight through the window and you've got Something a good, good, yeah, yeah. This is these ideas that people don't always think about. They're like, oh, like, how can I hang a light up in this room? And it's like, well, maybe you can just bounce it off the corner and then, exactly. you know, add a bit of lighting control and then, yeah, you can get something pretty cool out of that. What do you think what your biggest challenge on your field of what we are doing now? Biggest challenge? Yeah. Pushing the limit. I want to always push the limit. Like, there's always something to chase there's always bigger and better faster bigger budgets uh -huh. you know like 
bigger ideas, all kinds of things like that. It's the challenge I think that I struggle with the most. Mm -hmm. Like I want to, like I'd love to have a camera crane on the car. That'd be cool. But Perth, I don't really think there's work for that. Mm -hmm. So you're like, hmm. But then again, you know, there's always ways to work around it. There's people up in, um, there's a guy in Canada that shoots and they have a four wheel drive with the arm and they got some amazing shots. So it's more, really? the challenge I'd say is working with it, what you have and making the most out of that. So you're just pushing the limits of creativity, like with your mind. It's not always the gear. Yeah, that, yeah. That, that's a good tip as well. Hey, everyone thinks oh, I have to have like the, the, the latest yeah. equipment and I'm bad the for that a lot of like I used to be really bad for that like uh, last year I shot a lot of projects on red like the Komodo uh -huh. or I used to use the old dragon and I'm like oh man it would be a bit better if I use this you know like it it is helpful in some circumstances but a lot of the time using a camera with more dynamic range or whatever like isn't really that advantageous you could better benefit from having know more lighting or knowing more about lighting and stuff like that the camera only does so much you know yeah so mm. i think you can better benefit from just learning how to use tools in uh -huh. different ways and yeah yeah it's not all about it's about the equipment and and team i think in your personal life i see that you are doing so many different projects everything what keeps you motivated <laughs> that's a really good one there's definitely days where the motivation is not there and I think it all comes down to discipline. What do you think? <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, like... You have like those... the bottom of my side. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, know, you ask some questions. <laughs> no, um, I think there's definitely days where you're like, man, like... You're just like getting smashed mm. with feedback or stuff or like... I find like being creative there's days where you just don't have great ideas yeah and you go to do a shoot and then you look at the footage and you're like man like that sucks like i could have mm -hmm. done better but it's just on the day like how it is you know yeah. yeah i think i think trying to answer your question is um basically what what's motivates me i love what i do yes. but um the problem is about um being so connected with the world and have like the youtube or read books or podcasts mm. the problem is we have too much information yes yeah and you start to be there's so many things that you start to learn and at the same time the more you learn it looks like you don't know anything mm. and that if you don't have discipline i think that can gives you anxiety and always thinking oh man what i could be doing but i'm um, someone is doing better than me and sometimes you forget that what you do is good don't worry about the other people what do you do what do you can make better what you can help other people and and we always forget that and you're always looking at oh, the green of my neighbor is greener than mine yeah you know? yeah it's hard sometimes you look at other people's work you're like oh man it's like so much better than mine and it's like well the actually the thing at the gym I go to, right away gym, best gym in Perth. Um, <laughs> I have to say that because it's it's so good. But um, on the wall it says it's you versus you, and yeah. it's true. Like you are your you, only enemy. You can't compare yourself to other people because yeah. you do that, and then you kind of just lose sight of what you're doing. Exactly. Like exactly. it's the same. Like if you're in a running race and you're looking at everyone else, you're not gonna. You not first of all, you're not looking where you're running, so you might run yeah. into a tree. And I, th I think, it, it, at least on my point of view, mm. is um, especially when you talk about social media, that it's a good thing in a way that you can showcase your work, everything that you are doing. I only know because of social media. Mm. But on the flip side, if you are not disciplined, mm. you think that other people are doing more than you and they have more opportunities than you. And, but, I think behind the scenes, everyone is struggling a lot and yeah. there are so many things that people need to face and at the end, I think social media is just... It's a tool. It's just a tool and, and just showing like 
the beauty of everything and not necessarily that's true mm. you know and I, I realized that and I think especially for me because my background was in IT I never had uh, photography or videography or anything be before yeah. and I realized that um, many people that are photographers they have like the ego here yeah. and they all the time oh I can do better than the other one I can do better than the other one they forget that everyone is a everyone. person on yeah we're all behind the scene. Exactly. It's Heavy hard. struggles, yeah. anxieties, yeah. I have to do something better and mm. forget the, the real world, hey? Yeah, it's, yeah. We all, like, everyone's human. It's easy to forget. And you look at other people's work and you're like, oh, they've got so much more work going at the moment. Yeah, no, really. It's like, there's no point focusing on who else has got more work. It's more focusing on yourself and, like, I find for myself, if like if I start to think like that, it's not gonna help me. So I'm like, I just no, focus no. on what I do and I just go with that. And yeah. Yeah. And I think when we start to do that, we forget that we always do that, get dismotivated, you don't do anything. And if you don't do anything, you're never gonna improve, you're not gonna have more clients, you're not gonna have more projects. Yeah. So there is no solution for that, right? No. It all comes down to yeah what you do, yeah how you go about. Cool, Tim. Where people can find you? You can find me on Instagram at thwvisuals. There's what? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the arm car, yeah. <laughs> um, the arm. Oh, you have to patent this. You have to register this. Hey, Tim. Yeah. That the arm car. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've got the little um, arm car patch. Did you? Yeah, there's a company called Boss Boss. Uh -huh. They make these little patches for like cameras and stuff. And there's like, I'll show you, I'll send you like a link. Yeah, um, please. Yeah, I've got the one. It's like a Porsche SUV and they use, they're very popular. Uh -huh. It's crane and camera cars and stuff in America and all around the world, in fact. And it's got like two little arms on the side. It says arm car at the bottom. So that's what's stuck on my um, control panel for when I'm shooting. Uh -huh. yeah. Oh, cool. Amazing, <laughs> yeah. man. Franco, you have any questions? <sighs> when we're working together. Oh, oh man. This weekend, maybe. I, I asked him a few months ago when I'm going to do it, a collaboration because I think. It, do you see like a relation between FPV drones or those drones that they are coming out now? Like for example, Inspire Three, Inspire. You you see like a connection of with what you do? Yeah. In your yeah. Work? We use a drone like I didn't use it on the last project, but the, actually no, I lie. I used it on the last client job. Yeah. But we did use it also on the first um, revved up TV episode, so we got some drone shots. Yeah. I think it's essential because yeah. you can it show the land each other, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They complement each other, so you can show the landscape, um, which helps tell your story and show, you know, contrast between different things. Yeah, um, all kinds. Yeah, and the FPV is cool. It's just a different. It's a whole other perspective. Yeah, exactly. And one question that. It very much is related with us. I know you talk a little, a little bit about the cameras and the quality of, of the cameras that you use. Yeah. Is necessary every time shoot with a really expensive camera less, like the, the Red Komodo or sometimes it's better maybe go lower in the budget because the, it's like it's going to be a marketing campaign just for social media. How do you choose the camera? If it's something that the client asks to you or you, or you offer, who is with that conversation that you have with the clients? Yeah, so generally everything, just because I have my um, black magic, I'll just shoot it on that. It's easy, easy yeah. to deal with. Um, for faster delivery stuff, I'd shoot on a Canon. Yeah. It's just, it's a lot faster. I don't need like a focus pull or anything like that. Exactly. Um, but yeah, it really depends. Like a social media campaign, it's not that important, I think. The image quality like there's not really something to fuss over i know some people really fuss over the fine details when it's being viewed on a phone screen it's vertical it is what it is like it doesn't have to be you know production high production quality exactly. it's yeah there's a time and a place for every tool yeah exactly. yeah but i think 
one thing I would fuss over is color. So like like yeah. we said before, the new DJI, the Mavic Three, yeah, the color's really nice on that. It's a lot more natural now, mm -hmm. whereas the older color in like the Mavic Two and stuff yeah. was a little bit funny looking. But yeah. it's yeah, I think that's one thing I'd fuss over, especially for like a social media campaign. You don't want people's skin tones to be too yellow or too pink or maybe even green or something. Mm. Mm. Wow. So that's all. Yeah. Cool. Team, yeah. thank you so much. Thank you. It was a pleasure to work with you. Oh, I, no, no, of course, we worked together before <laughs> yes, as well, yeah. but uh, I don't know why I said working. <laughs> <laughs> but um, thank you so much for coming here. And it, it looks like there's so many things that you could be talking and uh, there's so many other projects or many things, but let's leave this for, for the next second, second yeah. episode. Yeah. Team, thank you so much. Thank you. Woo! Yes. I have a feeling that's the second time I'm talking with Tim today. There's one now. Th third one. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, as I said, we, we have opportunity to work like two or three times. Man, to be yeah. honest with you, there are some cards. I, it's, I'm ashamed to say that there are some cards that I think belongs to you. No, I remember. But they are old ones. I picked up the Angel Bird card. Unless I did leave a card with the guy from Perkins. Oh, but that's alright. Yeah. It was a cheap card anyway. There is like a one really, but it's 16 gig. I don't know what you did with that. <laughs> it's a bad word. Yeah. <laughs> 16. <laughs> it's one thing I'm making. 16, you know. And and uh, we have opportunity to work with the team like two, three times. Yeah. Oh, yeah a couple of times now. The Maca 200. Yeah. yeah. That, that was that, that, that that's full on man. Yeah. i can't believe you do that the edits like the end of the day and you have like 30 what's it an hour or 30 minutes to do that edit yeah <laughs> i couldn't yeah. do that i'd be nah keep nah, the no, auto cutting in, in da vinci with the yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and the funny thing is all the time if you don't know I don't know if you were there and someone was always here uh, yeah. and asking for me oh what are you doing and say, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. so I put the phone in. yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah so sometimes you need to do whatever you have to do for yeah. the client man and <laughs> run things up and yeah. be quick that's it. I found um but not the same thing, but like editing, as, like editing in a fast environment like that, I couldn't do it. The pressure, like right? And especially this week, like I spent, so I shot, uh, I went to Collie Wednesday last week, uh -huh. and we shot a dinner thing, and then we shot the next day, cars on the track. Day after that, I went to Ascot, and we shot like a machinery thing, and they're like, oh, can you do? photos we want some photos of machines but we also want like a little wrap video of this event and i was like all right like we can do a little wrap up video and so i shot everything in 709 on a r5 i'd never used a camera before and i was like oh, no. oh man that's a beast mm -hmm. yeah it's a great camera i really like was impressed by it awesome. yeah just the photos the color is really good uh -huh. like i loved it um but yeah, the whole weekend, like editing the photos, I had 1600 photos. I got it down to, I think I delivered 200 maybe, uh -huh. the machinery and stuff. And then the wrap video, and then the video also from the racetrack. Ooh, it was like three full days of editing. I was like, man, I need someone to do this. <laughs> because ideally, like, ideally, I have an editor. Um, send them the proxies they do I get it back and I can do little minor changes uh -huh, uh -huh. and then also that frees up more of my time so I can go more and look creative. for yeah look for other projects or look for work uh -huh. you know progress makes sense man yeah makes sense. And, and why you use the R5 um, it's what my friend had ah cool it's, it's actually so good yeah, I, because I have to confess for you, man, and I think Frank is with me on this. Um, I don't know if before we used to talk about Black Magics. Yeah. Black Magic is still one of my favorite cameras. I mm. love Black Magic, but we start to use Sony's. Yeah, yeah. Man, 
So Black Magic is. <laughs> Man, <laughs> seriously, if you have the opportunity, when you talk about photos and videos, try to use. Uh, we use like Sony's the the R5, R R4. Oh, it's not R. No, no, it's Sony Alpha. Sony A74. A74. Ah. A74. Yeah. And um. Photos, videos, especially in low light. Yeah. Yeah. A7, I had someone shoot a job for me on an A7S3. Yeah. And it has good camera there. Yeah. 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 It's, um, and especially, have you seen like the new, the FX6 and the FX3? Yep. 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 So apparently, someone from Ari started working at Sony, the color science engineer or whoever they are. Uh -huh. they're called. And now their color, the new color profile they have is a bit. It's more natural, the colors are... This is completely different, man. Yeah. All those new cameras are completely different. Mm -hmm. And um, funny enough that you're saying that is um, more and more we have opportunity to work with people that do like um, TV series for Disney, um, Apple TV, Netflix. And those guys, they are using FX3 and FX6. Yeah, they're such... I reckon they're like... Remember how the C200 was sort of like a workhorse for quite a while? I think that's the FX6 is like that. Yeah, exactly. Just a bit more compact. It's got all the controls for sound. It has that, you know, the ND thing? Mm. That's really good. Yeah. Because you can ramp it up and down. And it's, really it's, cool. it's, it's, it's amazing. It, it's, it's sad for us because we have like still stuff from Canon. Mm. But I think it's lovely you're going to be changing because all the cameras, everything, we work this weekend and this changed our lives, man. We yeah. all, I always was complaining about back pain, yeah. too heavy, every stuff, but... Yeah. Focus. Yeah, that's... Uh, yeah. Focus. Maybe that's another podcast. Yeah. <laughs> you bought the media focus for the Canon, for the Black Magic. Yeah, we bought like the... So it's yeah. more way, more money that you spend, yeah, yeah. more things to learn, yeah. more things to fail. Yeah, as well as... more things for the next episode. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Thank See you, you next time. Cheers. <laughs>